It's the nightly resistance report, uh, January 23rd, 2017. Good evening. Well, this is quite a weekend. The first weekend of the Trump administration, a huge outpouring, estimated at something in the order of three million people on the streets, in our major cities, but also on seven continents, including Antarctica, marching marching not only in opposition to Donald Trump and his agenda and his administration, but also marching in favor of human rights and social justice and the progressive agenda that will be back, that is being developed. In fact, it was the largest, most jubilant, most aggressive in many positive ways outpouring that I have seen personally since the Vietnam War and since the anti-Vietnam War movement. That's encouraging. Now, we've got to be quite careful. Making statements and marching is no substitute for political action. So we've got to keep it going and keep that energy up and, and keep people fired up and you also be fired up even if you were not able to march. Uh, secondly, we've got to engage in direct organizing and mobilizing, particularly with regard to the 2018 midterms almost on top of us because the organizing behind the midterm elections starts immediately. People are already lining up. Candidates are being selected. Primary candidates are already diving in and at the state level as well. We've got to be organized and mobilized, and we also have got to be very practical and strategic. And finally, it is very important that all of us avoid the temptation to normalize what has happened. This is not, again, I want to emphasize, a normal time with a normal, simply conservative administration in Washington. There's nothing normal about Donald Trump or the people around him. As we have also discovered this weekend, uh, Trump's speech before the CIA, frankly, I've never seen anything like it. Now, I have seen Trump's speeches, but right there in front of the honored, hallowed wall of fallen CIA operatives and heroes, for Trump to be boastful and to basically indulge his narcissism and celebrate his victories was obnoxious. We also saw the same thin skin, the same vindictiveness, the same lying over and over again, not only by Trump, but also by Trump surrogates. His chief of staff, Reins Priebus, his press secretary, Sean Spicer, quite a performance by Spicer, and also his counselor, Kellyanne Conway, on the weekend shows, his surrogates. The interesting thing, the best presidents in the United States uh, hire people around them to complement their weaknesses. That is, those presidents, and this is true of good managers anywhere, anywhere, they understand what their weaknesses are, and so they hire people who will offset those weaknesses. But Quite the contrary, Donald Trump has hired people who have the same characteristics he does, who simply magnify his lies, tell them even more often, magnify his own belligerence, magnify his hatefulness, and also the Trumpian form of narcissism, and the denigration of the press over and over and over again. What worries me here, and here again is a potential danger, it is a danger in terms of what they're up to. If Donald Trump succeeds, I don't think he will, but his obvious intention and the people around him also clearly intend to reduce public confidence in the press, to create the assumption, to create the idea that there is a kind of conspiracy in the press, in the media, to bring Donald Trump down and to offset that so-called conspiracy with Donald Trump's own direct communications with the public through not only tweets and rallies, but maybe more videos, maybe direct access. In this new world, it is possible. I have direct access. We have a kind of direct access in a way 
Do you see the danger with regard to a president who has demagogic instincts? Because then our democracy is finished. Then we have no way of even knowing what he's up to. We have no way of questioning what he is up to. No way of knowing the truth. Today, Donald Trump started after NAFTA and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now, I am not a big fan of either, and I think there are tremendous problems with NAFTA. It could be improved. I hope Donald Trump does improve it. Uh, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the nails uh, were already in the coffin. He just nailed them, hammered them into the coffin. Uh, but what's really going on here, and what is Donald Trump up to? Well, I think it is a distraction. It's a distraction from what's really happening, from the big, big issues he doesn't want to talk about. He'd much rather have headlines about NAFTA and the Trans-Pacific Partnership today than what the Republicans and Trump are actually planning on the Affordable Care Act. They don't have anything to take its place. They don't want to take a drubbing. Trump doesn't want the public to realize that he promised on day one that would be repealed and replaced and we are past day one. Number two, he doesn't want to talk about the big corporate tax cut that he and the Republicans are planning. It's large. It is going to mean either a larger budget deficit or fewer services for the public, especially the lower middle class, working class, and the poor. Thirdly, he doesn't want to talk and have any more stories about his, his conflicts of interest, his financial conflicts of interest, or his tax returns. On the weekend, Kellyanne Conway, his counselor, said he is not going to provide his tax return, period. Now remember, during the campaign, and even after the campaign, repeatedly, Donald Trump said, well, I'm being audited. I will provide my tax return as soon as the audit is over, as soon as it is available. Well, now, apparently, there will be no tax return. Kellyanne Conway said, the public doesn't care. You care. I care. We should care, because the problems and scandals potentially besetting the Trump White House having to do with his assets not being in a blind trust under an independent trustee and the Russian connection and the possible investigations about that Russian connection are intimately related to what? To his tax returns that he doesn't want us to see. Because in those tax returns, very likely our information about the debts that Donald Trump has, to whom? Well, you figure it out. It's not hard because big banks and big lenders in the United States are not and have not been giving Trump and Trump's organization any money for years because he went bankrupt four times. And so where is he getting his money? It is not, to me, unlikely that he's getting at least a lot of money from some of the big oligarchs around Putin. Follow the money. We can't as long as he refuses to provide his tax returns, and we are not going to see his tax returns, but the burden of proof is now on Donald Trump to show we should not be concerned. We should trust him. And so, now ending day three the first three days, full days, of the Trump administration, we see the beginnings of a massive movement. We see a White House that is defensive and angry. And we also see a Trump who is trying to divert attention from what he doesn't want us to pay attention to. What we'll try to do in the resistance report every night is focus on what the big patterns and big stories are. Thank you. See you tomorrow.